already all right well we welcome our online community we love you we love you we love you wherever you are we invite the presence of god to be right there with you and you get a deep revelation of how much you're loved right now just a few weeks ago i met uh pastor art Polowski, and um it, we had a wonderful uh sharing time we were both ministering in grand rapids michigan and we had dinner together um uh, only to uh, quite by accident, his plane was delayed about five days later than where I was going to just go to my room or for Linda was with me. Oh, she just texted saying she's praying for us right now. She's in the state of Washington with Rebecca. Um, uh, and I, I told them, I, I'm, I'm just going to go to sleep early. We're traveling all day and I um, rather skip dinner and just, just rest. And then when we arrived, we're driving in. This is in um, Aiken, South Carolina, right next to Augusta, Georgia. Um, and uh, he said, well, Pastor Art Pulaski is here, and he'd like to have dinner with you. So, oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll be ready for dinner. I'll, I'm, I'm happy to have dinner with him. So that was just five days after that. We have a wonderful prayer time. It was so funny. Uh, Pastor Art was very relaxed. He was in shorts and a nice little shirt, but just... You know, I think whatever, just very, you know, casual. We had a fun, fun night and a great prayer time after dinner. We prayed for each other. Only to find out that his, you know, the reason he was there, well, he was there ministering the same church where I was going, and both, well, both of us were doing television, and uh, the the um, uh, his flight was delayed, so that's why he was held over a day, which caused us to then uh, unite again, and so I just casually said, "Where are you headed next?" And he said, "Flying to Seattle Tacoma Airport," and I said, "Get out of here, we're we're we're." going there in, in three days too. So we were in Grand Rapids, Aiken, South Carolina, and then in the upper Northwest within 10 days in three cities together. You don't have to be a prophet to figure God is, knit, is knitting something. Amen. And the Lord did knit our hearts together. It's just an extraordinary way. We, you know, when somebody's in your tribe, and, and you, you're you're arm in arm and have the same vision and same clarion call. It's, it's just an extraordinary thing. Uh, and the Lord knit our hearts. So let me, I introduced him yesterday at the conference this way. Uh, I said, how many of you have been arrested for baptizing your daughter? I haven't. How many of you have been arrested for inciting people to attend church? That's the, that was the law that he broke, inciting people to attend church. He was arrested for that. May you all incite people to attend church. <laughs> Anybody here been arrested for feeding the hungry? They said, no, you can't do that. You can't give away free food. That's illegal. The name of his church is Street Church. Because they're in the street. They have a building, you know, but they are in the street ministering to people. Amen. Yeah, clap to the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. So uh, please help me warmly welcome a lion of God, this illegal outlaw. <laughs> Stand to your feet and welcome Pastor Art Pulowski. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pastor, when you put it that way, it is kind of funny. Inciting people to come to church. Guilty as charged. Feeding the poor. Guilty as charged. Officiating a church service. Guilty. Guilty, guilty, 
To add to the list, 2006, I was the first clergyman in Canada to be arrested and I faced a year jail time for publicly reading Bible in part. That's 2006. 2005, the police and the bylaw officers came and they announced that right now in Canada, it's illegal to feed the poor, it's illegal to congregate, preach the gospel, all kinds of different things. Now it's illegal. So I read the constitution and in the constitution, in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada, the preamble, it starts with those words. Whereas Canada acknowledges the supremacy of God and the rule of law. When you kick God out, you don't have rule of law. And I think that's exactly what is happening to the United States of America. That's exactly what is happening in Australia, New Zealand, and Europe. We've done a pretty good job kicking God out. And finally, he says, okay, have it your way. You want hell? Fine. A little bit of a taste. So we have a little bit of a taste of what's going on around the greatest separation between the fake and the real, the sheep and the goats, the sheep and the wolves. Now you got two kinds of categories. You got the muzzled slaves and you've got the free. And there is a clashing of the spirits. Those that want to remain free are being attacked by those that are miserable. Because you see, misery loves company. And they will do everything in their power to bring you into their level, into their misery. This morning I was able to preach in Spanish a little bit. What was that word, Pastor? Okay. Cerca, cerca, the fence. You see, I'm speaking Spanish. <laughs> cerca. <laughs> About the fence, the vision that I had, I shared that vision, and I kept, and I will keep sharing that vision because it's so real, and it's in front of our very eyes when God is shaking everything, the foundation that we walk on. He shook me. He still is shaking me. He's shaking everyone. You see? He is shaking the entire world. The fence was so big, and I knew it represents the whole world, and the people were sitting on it. I'm telling you, for too long, we have enjoyed the cruise. We were fist, sitting on the fence, and, and we were observants instead of participants. And finally, God says, enough, it's enough, and he shook, and he's still shaking the fence. And I saw people falling to the left and to the right, the goats and the sheep. God is separating clearly, and there is a fence between us. Two kingdoms, two types of people, those that believe God and those that bow before Fauci, the liars, the kings of this earth, the Nebuchadnezzars, those that are willing to bow before men rather than bowing before God. He spoke to me, he said that when I'm done, Everyone will have to make a decision, either me or the devil, either left or right. You're choosing your destiny right now. Once he said to me, the greatest tragedy for a man is for that man to miss his destiny. Not every single one of us, you, me, Fauci, I know, Biden, even though he doesn't know where he is, most of the times he thinks he's in China. Even for him, there was a destiny the moment he was born. And there is nothing more tragic than a man that missed his destiny. Nothing more tragic than that. Abraham Lincoln said those words, Be sure you put your feet in the right place, then stand firm. I have done that. I put my feet firmly on the rock, and that's why I like Hopefully this will not fall. The lion is standing on the rock that cannot be shaken. He is the rock. He is the lion from the tribe of Judah. When you stand with him on that rock, you cannot be shaken. The enemy will not have anything on you. So I have put my feet firmly on the word of God. You see, I used to work for the devil. Now I'm working for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm not going back. There's not the amount of money 
that you can offer me to go back to hell. Because you see, there is a, a realization that every man has to come to that you have only but few hours on this side of eternity, and then there is eternity. And eternity, that's a very long time. We can't even understand what that means. We have been bound, boxed within the time. Everything dies. Everything decays. It's like my wife says, the moment you're born, there's always something that wants to eat you. The moment you were born, you started to die. And that's the reality. So you're dead. Some of you just don't know it yet. So now the whole, the whole thing is, do you know where you're going? Because every man will die, but not every man truly lives. Remember the famous quote from Braveheart? You see, he understood, those heroes of old, they understood the concept. To live as a slave is not worth living. You see, I used to be a slave to the devil. Now I'm free and no man were going, is going to put me back into chains. You see, they can lock me up in prison. They can do that. But I still will be the freer man in the entire prison. I'm going to share with you the most important message that I have in my entire life. I'm going to share with you my heart and what I saw that changed my life. And I wish that every believer, every person on earth would see what I saw. If you would see what I saw, you would never be lukewarm. You would never be a pew warmer. You would never be just satisfied with coming to church once a week or twice a week. It would be everything or nothing. It will be life or death. It will be a passion of your life. Here is a very interesting thing I have found from one of your great leaders. Lincoln Abraham said this. My dream is of a place and a time where America will once again be seen as the last best hope of earth. It looks like, it feels like he's talking to you and me right now. And I'm telling you, God spoke to me. He said that uh, people around the world are watching Americans. And they're asking questions. Will America rise up? Will Americans come to our defense? Will they stand up? And remember what he said to me? He said, tell this great American eagle that it's time for that eagle to rise up and start flapping its wings. He calls you great American eagle. You have made a covenant with the living God in 1776. The founding fathers made a covenant with God. You see the difference between America and Israel, and I believe that you are connected, is this. God looked at, uh, at Israel and says, would you be my people? He picked them. But you see, the founding fathers of America picked God. And this is what they said to God. God, would you be our God? And God says, yes, I will be your God. That's why in the Declaration of Independence, in the Constitution of the United States of America, and all the founding fathers' letters, God is all over. Have you read your documents? God is right there. It looks like, it feels like he was writing those words with the founding fathers. He took the covenant. He says, yes, I will be your God. For Israel, he picked them, but Americans picked God. That's the difference. And I truly believe that America is to play again a key part in his revival. I asked him, I said, God, Americans are this and they've done this and, you know, terrible things. And abortion, and homosexuality, and transgender, and, and pornography, all those different things. Americans are the leaders of this iniquity. But he calls you great eagle. He says, God, explain it to me. He says, here is the answer. America is still the number one force if it comes to evangelism. You send more missionaries around the world than any other nation on earth. Also, you give more money for a kingdom of God, for evangelistic efforts than any other nation on earth. You see, he still wants his country. He still 
says to you and me, rise up, stand up, start flapping your wings. Again, he wants Americans to rise up. I'm going to share with you what changed me. You see, many people have watched the videos and you've seen the video, Get Out Nazis. And, and you know, many people will come to me and says, you're a hero. And I share that so many times. I don't feel like a hero. What did I do? I did what every pastor is required to do. As a shepherd, that's my job. I just did my job. I kicked evil out of the church. Every father, every grandmother's son, every daughter is required to do the same thing. Get out, you uncircumcised Philistines. That you, sh you should defy the armies of the living. God, how dare you? Get out from my restaurant. Get out from my business. Get out from my house. Get out from my church. Get out from my White House. See, those people, they think they own you. For whatever twisted reason, they really think you are the slaves and they are the masters. You know when that ends? When you rise up, stand up and say, get out. In order to stop a bully, it requires only a very simple thing. I'll tell you how I dealt with bullies. And I had them in school. Everywhere, actually, you deal with bullies. I've dealt them Polish style. I'll tell you how the Polish style is. You punch the guy in the nose, and he knows you're not going to put up with that. You see, all the sandwiches that they're stealing from us, you see, my mom makes the best sandwiches on earth. It's mine. It was given to me from my mommy, and no bully is going to steal that away from you. That's my sandwich. You want to take it? You will end up with a Polish love. Head-on collision. You know, I said many times, we have been attacked by Antifa on a number of occasions, and I will tell them. I'm an honest man. I cannot lie anymore. So I would tell them, listen, the next thing is going to happen to you. It's your face in that dirt. I don't want to do it. I'm a pastor. I love you. Just go away. Stop, stop swinging those featherly, you know, hands or I'll break them. Don't do it. I don't want to do that. I love people. But if you keep flapping your wings, something is going to happen to you. And they always think I'm joking. I'm not joking. I mean, I'm joking a lot, but I'm not joking at that time. But they think I'm joking, so they will keep swinging. And the next thing they see is their face on the ground in the dirt. And they're surprised. And they will say, well, I thought you're a pastor. I am. But I am a Polish pastor. <laughs> and I warned you. I will punch you in the nose, and then, then I will pray for healing. That's a Polish style, Pastor. I don't want to do it, but if you want, I'll, I'm at your service. I grew up behind the Iron Curtain under the boots of the Soviets. I've seen terrible things the government doing. You see, Americans are still a little bit shocked by what is happening to them because they think government will not turn on you. You think you've elected them and and they are to serve you. But listen to a Polish guy. The government is wicked. If you don't put a check to their powers, they will keep taking, stealing, robbing, and murdering. You have to remember that Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party, the first victims of Nazi party, were not the Poles, were not the Jews. They were the German people. Dachau, Buchenwald, the concentration camps were built for the German people first. Hundreds of thousands of German people, good people that stood against Adolf Hitler end up dead. You know that? There were many good German people. You see, when you read history, we see the entire nation going nuts, but that's not the truth. There were hundreds of thousands of German people that opposed Adolf Hitler. They saw what was going on. There were good, God-fearing Christians, and they said, this is wrong. What I see right now in our governments, I stand up and I say, this is wrong. This is wrong. There's still good people around. There is the remnant. God always has his remnant. The first people that went to the slaughterhouse were 250,000 disabled, murdered by the Nazi party. Then they were babies. You know Adolf Hitler murdered tens of thousands of babies? When he said to them that if they are not of a pure blood, go and murder them. And tens of thousands of German women 
went. You see, the beginning was, which I believe there is no greater evil than a mother murdering her own baby. If a mother can murder her own baby, what do you think is going to happen to you if she has her way? Nothing of the gloves are off. Those types of people will do anything to anybody else if they can murder their own flesh and blood. Then they murdered the homosexuals and then they murdered the Jews and then they attacked the Europe. And you see, bully never stops. Evil never stops. Evil has to be stopped. So I grew up hearing all those stories from my grandparents. And of course, I grew up in a city that had a concentration camp during the Nazi era. And every year I would go to Auschwitz-Birkenau just to see. See, they are not teaching us history anymore. That's why we're repeating. You know, remember every year there, this, uh, there would be a slogan, lest we forget. Well, we have forgotten already. And that was just happening a few years ago. So I grew up in that kind of a country when we were being told to call Stalin one of the greatest bloody murderers, Dedushka Stalin, Grandpa Stalin. We were being told that he's the savior. We were to call him savior because he saved Europe from evil. <laughs> we didn't know anything that was really going on. It turned out that this guy was the bloodiest murder, mass murder in history. And a Mao Zedong. And Hitler was actually a puppy in comparison to you see, that's exactly what is happening right now. Misinformation, propaganda, lie after lie after lie. But I used to be part of this, you know. I decided very early on that if I, I hated the system, but I decided to use the system. I wanted to be a successful man. I wanted to do stuff and accomplish something. And on this view, I had only two choices, to be on the other side of the, or be part of the problem, part of the Communist Party. You could not achieve anything unless you were part of the communist. So I decided to become an outlaw. And I, I became a smuggler. I was smuggling stuff. I was working with mafia people. And we were smuggling gold from Russia, alcohol from Yugoslavia. We smuggled everything you can imagine. I mean, I was selling everything. I would go to Czechoslovakia. I would go to East Berlin or Vienna, Austria, and I would bring stuff, I would smuggle stuff, and everything was done by bribe, bribery, left and right. You see, communism and socialism and fascism, the foundation of those totalitarian regimes is bribery, you know that? The whole country, if you look at the history, everything that was done, it was done by bribery. Hitler was bribing his generals as well. He was giving them houses, he was giving them arts, he was giving them gold. There's always bribery involved. That's why God says, I hate bribery. But I was a very corrupted man, and that was the only way I thought I can forward what I needed and wanted. I started to drink. I remember when I was a, a young man, I would go to a restaurant and I would order 30 champagnes for everyone. And, I became a private banker. I walked with a gun, and I was pretty good at beating people up, too. I, was, I made it to the national, representing my country in boxing. Then I became martial art expert, black belt. I used to teach people how to hurt other people. And then we escaped. We escaped to Greece on a big boat through Istanbul, Turkey, to Athens, Piraeus, and we stayed there for five years. And very soon, I started my own company over there. Started to make lots of money, and I met my wife. She was a, a born-again Christian. She just received Christ, and she wanted to serve him. And she met me, a devil, on her path. She paid dearly for that. Seven years of hell, literally hell for her. It's a long story. I don't have time to tell you how everything unfolded. But you see, I hated people. 
in a business realm, I've seen so much evil, so much blood that every man and every person next to me was a potential shark, poten potential wolf. And I always said, well, watch, watch your back. You always have to be vigilant because those people are after your money. And that's how I viewed the war. And I hated the church because when I was a kid, I saw the corruption in the Catholic church and I saw the hypocrisy of the whole system, this devilish religious system. Now I see it everywhere. I see it in the Protestant church and I see it in the Catholic church. It's the same thing. Religion controls people. Jesus sets the captives free. That's the difference. But I saw the system controlling and I didn't want to have anything to do with the, with the hypocrisy. I decided it's better for me to be at least real and do what I do than to pretend that I'm somebody else. But my wife was, she was totally different. She's so good in people. And I remember those conversations and, and I was intrigued by that and we would go partying i would go partying and i'll take her and i would say look what a loser <laughs> you know look at this guy what a loser he can't even get a decent job i was you know silk and cars and i was making lots of money and everybody else was a loser but she would say but you know look how amazingly he talks to his wife how gentle he is and how loving she would always find something good even if in a very terrible person. I said, that's weird. But you see, I was intrigued. I was being drawn. God was setting up <laughs> the future. The future of Canada, for sure, by bringing me there. And years were passing. I remember, to, you know, 1992, I received Christ for the first time. And it shook me a little bit. And I went back straight to business. And business has the power to suck you back in. I was a heavy drinker. And I was very successful. And then in 94, I received Christ for the second time. And then in 95, and 97, and 99. And I remember one time I'm sitting in the church and the pastor is like, Art, you need Jesus. And I flipped. How many times? And one man needs to receive Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. You're nuts. How many times? And he's just like, I, I love the man. He is so different than me. I will probably punched Art Pulaski in the face. But he was so gentle. He says, Art, you need Jesus. <laughs> you need Jesus. I knew he was right i needed jesus you see it shook me for a while i call it donald duck experience you know when we were growing up that's pretty much the only thing we were allowed to watch mickey mouse and donald duck donald duck is a very interesting fella because he goes a little bit here and a little bit there you know how the ducks walk that's majority of christians a little bit of god and a little bit of the world mixing together sitting on a fence and that's what god is dealing with Today, I was Donald Duck. I was a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but mostly the devil. And I remember, I remember I pray, you know, I, I declared those words one day. I said, I'll serve the one that gives me more. I will serve the one that gives me more. Is that not the case with majority of Christians these days? They're serving the one that either they fear more. And the Bible says, do not fear the one that control your body. Or kill your body but fear the one that control your soul into hell but majority of the christians are fearing those that can kill the body and they're neglecting ignoring the one that holds your life your body and your soul in the palm of his hands so i was very corrupted i was a heavy drinker many times i would not know what i did how many people i would beaten and the stories i've heard afterwards what i have done my wife stopped coming out with me. She would refuse to go out. I said, why are you not going out with me? Well, because you're going to beat someone up and there's always going to be a drama and blood and all that stuff. And so I started to go by myself everywhere and I would just come back. And most of the time I remember those parties, me being awakened, holding on a toilet, puking all night long. That was my wife for a while. And I would look at my, my hands and they were all bloody. And so I knew I was in a fight again. And 
then they would tell me how many people I have beaten the night before. And that was going on for a few years. And yet at the same time, I was a very successful businessman. If you look at me, you would never know that this guy is such a wreck. And my wife, she was always telling me about this God. Always telling me about this God. Since I met her, she, she said, you know, there is God in heaven. And he loves you. And, and I said, no, I hate religion. I hate I hate Christianity. I'll never, ever go to a church in my entire life. But you see, women, you've got no idea what kind of power you possess. There is nothing more powerful than a prayer of a mother or a wife. In the Bible, every prayer of a woman was answered. You know that? The desperation of a woman, it's unbelievable. It touches the heart of God. Keep praying for your husbands. Keep praying for your children. Do not give up. She did not, and here I am in front of you because of her prayers. See, I was a very corrupted man, and my wife understood how I function. You see, for me, love was a business transaction. You know, you love someone because there is an exchange. My parents love me because they don't have a choice. And I love them because I don't have a choice, right? I love my brother because he's my brother. And I will do business with some people because there is an exchange. So that's how my brain was functioning. So my wife, I said to her, you know, when she was asking me to take her to, to the church, being me, I would say, sure, here is the price. You do pierogies for me. Pierogies are a Polish dish. It takes uh, all day to make it. So this poor girl... Every week she had to make pierogies, and I was a young, fit guy. I could eat many of them. And you do a massage for me. Those two things. Deal? Deal. And that was going on for a year. So here is how it was going. I would, she would pay the price, and I would take her the next day to the church, and I would order a coffee and Polish ponchki, which is... A donut. I mean, you Americans got no idea about donuts. Sorry to say that, but that's the truth. The truth shall set the captives free. <laughs> donuts? Polish. It's called ponchki. You've never really lived unless you taste that stuff. So I was sitting in the back. I did not care about the preaching. I did not listen to the preaching. I was there because my wife paid the price, and I was a man of my word. And I would order two ponchki coffee, and I was reading books. That was my participation in the church. And that was going on for a year. And finally, I was sick and tired of ponchki, sick and tired of pierogies and massages. I said, you know what? I'm not going to drive you there anymore. I'm actually going to read the Bible. I'm going to prove it to you that this whole thing is a big, fat lie. So I read the Bible. And I could not find much. I mean, I did dig some stuff in my twisted mind. I thought, okay, I got you. But every time I would bring this, kind of like the house of cards would fall. So I said, I'm not going to win this way. And I am a winner. I want to win. So what I did, I said, you know what? I'm going to listen to the preacher. And I'll prove it to you that he wants me there only because of my money. So I sat as far as I could, just, just like you. As far as I could, <laughs> hiding behind somebody so I would not be seen and I would listen for the first time really in my life I would listen to a Protestant pastor and here is the story he was talking about unconditional love he was talking about God that loves me just because I exist he loves me because he just created me you see he loves me not for what I did not what I'm going to do just because he loves me. I could not understand that kind of a love. You see, my love was corrupted, was bribery, was exchange. It was a business transaction. He loved me just because I was. And I started to cry. I could not understand. Listen, people and men like me never cried. I was a fighter. You don't show emotions ever. You don't show weaknesses ever. You're a lion. You're, I was a wolf at that time. And you don't show that you're bleeding because you see, you see sharks are all over when they smell blood it's over for you a predator never shows emotions and i'm crying and I, I i don't understand what's going on with me i mean this is weird and i hated it and i was of course hiding that no one would see 
I think that was the first blow that I got from the Holy Spirit. And there were many more. Eventually, we emigrated to Canada, Calgary, Alberta. I didn't care about the church. I didn't care about God. I went through a very heavy depression, suicide attempt. I was 22 years old in a friend's house, minister of culture. He gave me his house, and he said, you can stay here forever if you want. And I remember climbing the roof. I was a very successful guy. I've seen a lot. I travel a lot. I had money, and I worked for the richest people on earth, and my friends were very famous people. And, and I was 22. You know how I felt? There are many people that are feeling the same way. I felt like an old man. I've tasted everything. And this is what I said. I said, there's nothing interesting for me right now. I've tasted everything. I feel like a very old man. And I went to the roof, and I was ready to, to jump. And I made a move, but someone stopped me. I could not do it. I didn't know what was going on. Now I know. But God stopped me from jumping. So I tried it a few times. I couldn't do it. Went down, of course, drinking. I became an alcoholic. I was drinking every single day. And my wife came and joined me to, she, uh, you know, she came to me to Calgary after a year and a half of emigration papers. And the first thing she asked me to do is take me to the church. So again, the game of bribery started again. I said, sure, if you do this, I'll take you to the church. So I'm sitting there, and the pastor is looking at me and sees that I'm, you know, a new face and says, would you stand up and introduce yourself? I hated that guy. <laughs> I really hated him. My wife stood up, and she was so grateful. that She was among Christians, not in hell with her husband. And then he says, and what about you? And I said, I'm just a taxi driver, and I sat down. <laughs> that was me, stubborn. And that was going on for a while. See, my wife was the light in the darkness, and I hated it. It was very weird because I loved her, and I hated her at the same time. And she was telling me about God. You see, I've done terrible things to my wife. And when I was drinking and she stood at the door when I was coming back from the parties, she would be flying left and right. And every single night she was crying in a bed and that satisfied me. Every single night I did everything I could only to hear her cry. You see, misery loves company. Those people are doing this to us because they're miserable. They don't know any better. They're in darkness. They need someone to tell them that there is freedom on the other side of that fence. But they have to be willing to jump. So she fought and she prayed. I remember those meetings in my house. So those weirdos were coming to my house. Christians. And they would bring books and they knew I love to read. And they would bring movies and Abraham and Moses. And I hated them. And they would talk politics with me, and they would talk history. They knew I love history. That was a perfect setup. And I would go to the washroom, and I didn't know that at that time, but my wife confessed all her sins after. And she said, you know, when the moment you left, we all like went to our knees and prayed. She said, God, do something with this devil. Just do something. Touch him. Touch him. When I would come back, it would like nothing happened. My, she says, I was anointing for years your pillow, wherever you were going, your boots, your car, whatever, anointing, praying, praying, praying. And then from time to time, I would find this weird, those movie, you know, Joseph at the VCR. And, you know, I would rent other movies, bad movies. But, you know, you run out of movies. At that time, there were no Netflix. You had to go and borrow a movie. So when I ran out of all the movies and I was bored, I would put, whatever, Joseph. Okay, fine. Abraham, Moses, apostles, this and that. That's how she was fighting. I remember the times, Calgary is a very, I call it my little Siberia. It's very cold. My record actually feeding the poor on the streets is minus 55 Celsius. So we have 20, 30, and during that time, I would not buy my wife a coat because I was so jealous that I would not want her to leave the house without me controlling every move she was making. 
and I would not buy her a proper boots and I would not buy her a coat. And she would beg me many times, just drive me to the church. You don't have to stay there. Just drive me there because it's very far and it's minus 30 Celsius. I'm afraid I'm going to, to die. And I would say, you love your God. Who do you love more, me or your God? And she will look in my face and she will say, I love you, but I love my God more. Boom. She would get a punch in the face. Who do you love more, God or me? And that was going on. I mean, and then she would go out. And after years, she would testify and she would say, you know how many times I almost froze to death? I had to run. I had to run so many times. Run. You know what she was doing for years? She was coming to the church to clean it. When she had an encounter with the devil, me, she would run to the church to clean it. And that was going on for years. And she would pray and pray and pray. One day, you know, sometimes she would go for a coffee is to have her time with God. And one day she came super happy. Super, I was not like her. She was to be miserable. You see, when you live with the devil, you have to be miserable. When you bow to the devil, you have to be miserable. But she came so happy, and I took notice. I said, why are you so happy? He says, well, God spoke to me. Oh, really? What did he say? And just a few days ago, I would come back from a party, and she would stand at the door. She would say, where have you been? And says, it's not your business. Did you sign the divorce papers? You see, I brought the divorce papers and I said, you sign it, I'll kill you. Take all the money I have, everything I have. I don't care about the money. I'll make more. Take everything. I'll buy you a ticket anywhere in the world and leave me. I hate you. I don't love you. Go. And if you don't go, I'll kill you. And I spat at her face. And she took it out and she would look straight into my eyes and she would say, you can spit at my face anytime you want. But I'm telling you, I'll always say it's just raining. How you deal with that? You can't deal with that. I, I didn't know. See, give me a Goliath and I'll punch him in the face. I'll fight. But how you deal with unconditional love? I didn't know how to deal with that. So a few days later, she comes back. She's so happy. And that disturbed me greatly. Why are you so happy? And she says, well, God spoke to me. So what did he say? Well, he said to me that he's going to beat you up so much that you will not know your name. <laughs> and I look at her, it's like, this is crazy. This is what this, he said that to you, yes. Because you see, I talked to him and I said, I have no father. And I, you see, my wife was born in prison. She never met her father until many, many years later. She was born in prison. Because her mom wanted to escape communism and she was caught. For that crime of escaping the country, she was sentenced to prison and my wife was born there. I have no brothers. I have no one to beat you up for what you're doing to me. I have no father, so I said to God, you be my father. You be my brothers. He says, fine. I'm going to beat him up so much that he will not know his name. And he was so, she was so happy. <laughs> she was so happy about it. You know, I smiled, but I knew this is a serious stuff. You see, supernaturally, I knew what is going to happen to me. I was a very, very successful businessman. And you would never know outside I was a monster. And I was a drunkard. And... It took God three months. I mean, he could do it in a day, I'm sure, but it took three months to finish me off. I had about 50 job sites, and at every job site, there was something missing. There was something stolen, and clients would not pay. And you know those different things that happened? Cash flow stops. I invested all my money, 
into new equipment and cars and trucks and all those different things. And at every corner, something was missing and clients stopped paying. And I even did huge church, big church. And the pastor didn't pay me. He paid me three months later, but that was over. And I remember the federal government flew three guys in black. The men in black came and they said, you're going to prison for not paying taxes and using government money for, you see, I paid my workers using the government money just to pay them because I thought this is going to, to come around. Those people will start paying and I did not steal anything, but I was not allowed to use the government money to pay for them. So they said, you're going to prison. And I asked six months. I said, give me six months. I'll work day and night and I'll pay you everything. Everything I own, I'll pay you. Call my lawyers, find out that I'm speaking the truth. And they did. Fine, you get six months. I worked day and night, nonstop. And I paid every penny that I owned to the people, to the companies and to the government. And I end up with nothing, zero. There was the biggest beating I've ever received in my life. Afterwards, I got a few more beatings, but this was the biggest one I ever received. He spanked me so hard that my bum hurts to this day for what I have done. And But you see what happened? This prophet came. Remember, Pastor, I was sharing yesterday about the prophets, and sometimes I still have this fear of prophets because when I did terrible things to my wife, I had a season of being good boy. And I would come to the church and I would even drive her to church and I would even sit with her in the church. So one day this prophet comes and he points a finger and says, because you're this and you've done this and because and he named all the sins I have been doing, I'm going to take everything away from you. You will lose everything. And, and that's exactly what happened. In the end of his speech, he said, and the only person that will know what is happening to you will be your wife. No one else will understand what you're going through and know what's really going on, except your wife. After I lost everything I'm telling you, I made my peace with God. I stopped drinking. I remember I put the bottle on the table and I look at it for three days. I look at the bottle that was still closed for three days. And on the second day, my wife looks at me and she says, should I call a doctor? She thought I went nuts. And this is what I said to her. And that's my message to all those people that are hooked on different things. I look at the bottle and, and, and I said this to her. I was to do great things in life. I was to achieve something. I know that I was born for something bigger than being a drunkard. I know that in my bones. And this thing owns me. I'm a slave to a bottle. This thing tells me what and how and where and with whom. I don't understand. How come a man like me became a slave to a bottle? There are many people that are slaves to a little thing, a bottle or, or a little pill or a little white powder or opiates or whatever it is. But let me tell you something. You have been called for a lot greater thing than die an alcoholic or a drug addict. When I thought my life was over at the age of 22, and later on when I was a drunkard, see, God came to my rescue. Yes, he did a spanking big time, but it brought me back to my knees. And on the third day, I put that bottle on the table again, and I watched it without saying a word, and I never opened it again. That was 22 years ago. I made peace with God. I apologized to my wife. I attended church and I became the biggest donor in the church. I gave 50% of the entire church. I was a very generous. I did not care about money. I did not care about all those different things. And this is how I thought my life was going to be. I was, I don't want to say genius. But I could make millions of dollars in a year, no problem. Money was not a problem for me. I remember the times and my wife, sometimes she tells the story how crazy this was. I would walk on the streets and I would stop and, you know, like you got Texas barbecue and you can smell it. I could smell money. And I would stop and I said to her, wait, wait a second. I smell money here. Just give me a moment. I'll tell you where they are. Right there. You see that? 
we will buy this and we're going to make millions of dollars, right? Just like that, because there is money. I can smell the money right there. So I did. I became a developer. I was a builder. I flipped things and I bought things and I sold things and it was very successful and I was very generous as well. I made peace with my wife. I made peace with God and she got pregnant. And another prophet comes to the church and he says, I'm going to give you a perfect gift. And we knew right away with my wife that this is a baby he's talking about. And my child was scheduled to be born on 28th of March, 2000. 28th of March, that's my birthday. So the doctor said he's going to be or she is going to be born on March 28, 2000. We were super excited. See, we made peace with God. I made peace with God. I stopped drinking. I attended church and every other functions. I prayed. I loved my wife and he cleaned me up. And you know the fighting, the beatings? When I received Christ again, all of those things took off. I, I did not fight anyone. I, no one attacked me. I was just a free man. It was the most beautiful thing. We were going to church. We were going to different retreats. Now I hate that word retreat because we are to advance, not to retreat. But at the time, <laughs> I was attending retreats and different other functions. And, and life was good. For months, we were looking for a name. We didn't know if it's a boy or a, or a girl because the ultrasound didn't show. So we were looking for different names, and I bought a number of books, and I rent from library tens of thousands of names. And that was our evening time together, just flipping pages and looking for the name for the baby. Nothing stuck. You know, there were beautiful names, but nothing. We knew, both of us, that this is not the name for that child. You know, you got that supernatural thing? And then there's 28th of March, 2000. My wife is in intensive pain, already delivering a baby. And I'm sitting over there, and that's how I deal with hospitals. I just like, I freeze. So I was reading a, a, a book. I, and at one time, I said, come on, let's be done with this. I'm getting sick. I can't, I can't stay here. And she's in pain, and I'm a suffering. <laughs> so I'm sitting over there, you know, my delivery, we have three children. My delivery was not that bad. It's just the time in hospital that was bothering me. So my pregnancy was not a big deal. It was my wife. She had a little bit tougher time. So I'm sitting there with our first baby, and I'm reading something, and then I yell, Stop! You have to stop. This baby is not coming. And she's like, Ah! You know, from between the... She says, you're crazy. She says, you cannot have this baby. I forbid you. Stop it. And she says, I can't stop it. Stop it immediately. And I gave, him a piece, gave her a piece of paper. It says, this baby is not coming out until you write down the names on that paper. God just spoke to me. And he says that we are to name this baby before it's born. She, I'm telling you, if she could kill, I would be a dead man. She couldn't do anything between the pain because they were very, very intense. The baby was almost coming out, but I would not have any of her explanations. Here's a paper, here's a pen you write down. So she knows me. She knows that I, if I put something like this, that's it, it's over. So she writes down between, ah, you know, and then she writes down, ah, she writes another. And I do the same thing without, ah, you know, so I'm writing down what I feel God is putting on my heart. And then I said, God spoke to me that the name that is on your paper and my paper, and remember, we did not know if it's a boy or a girl. That's the baby is going to be born. Remember the prophet said, I'm going to give you a perfect gift. We knew it's the baby. He is, or she is being born the same day I was born, like a gift. And then the only name that was on my wife's paper and my paper was the name Nathaniel which in Hebrew means gift from God. And we didn't know if it's a boy or a girl. The only name that was the same on her paper and mine was Nathaniel, a gift from God. And my son was born dead. He did not breathe. He did not move. He was purple. 
It was the most devastating thing I've ever seen. And the eyes of my wife, I'll never forget them. See, she just went through hell back and forth. And now I've lost all my money and I was rebuilding my company. And we were so poor at that time. And, and suddenly there is a baby, the promised one. You see, I could not figure it out what was going on. The promised one born my the same day I was born, he names a gift from God and is born dead. He's not breathing. And the doctors and the nurses, and I look at the eyes of my wife, you know, those big eyes. She knew what was going on. Terrified eyes. I'll never, ever forget those eyes. Terrified. You see, the mother, when a mother has a baby, the first thing that subconsciously a mother is waiting for is a cry of a baby. But that cry did not come. She knew something is it's so wrong. Well, the first thing that happened after I don't know how long time, he was not breathing for a very long time. He was purple, lifeless. And the first thing later on, they said that they don't know how, but they managed to bring him back. But they found out that he has a hole in here in the diagram, diaphragm, this muscle that separates the bowels from the upper chest. He has a hole, and through that hole, all the bowels went up and smashed his entire upper chest. And they did not catch this during the ultrasound. So that was a surprise. And it turned out that the heart was pushed to the other side, and when they opened him up, they said that there is not even a trace of a line. This kid will never live. It's impossible for this kid to survive. So they asked me to unplug him. They said even if he lives... He's going to be a vegetable for the rest of his life. And I went into a rage. If you have seen a Polish guy in rage, I was that Polish guy. I was so furious. I was yelling, kicking car, that the guy that watched me runs for his life. He thought I'm going to start killing left and right. I yelled at God. I called him names. And then eventually I calmed down and I stopped talking. But my wife, on the other hand, you see, she was always the fighter. And when I tell the story, I say, listen, what you see is me being a big mouth. The power in the family is her. She is the motor. She is the fire. She is the fate behind everything is going on. She has never given up. So she started the way she fought for me. She started to fight for her son. And she called everyone, and the pastor showed up, and the, and the pilgrimage started to come of Christians laying hands and anointing that boy. And I would just stood over there and watch the whole thing, and I would not say a word. I was devastated. I was broken. I was, you know, why me? Have you ever been in a situation, why me? Why not the neighbor? Why is this happening to me? Why not to him? And I yelled at him, well, who do you think you, you know, I am? I'm not your job. You already had job. I'm just Art Pulaski. Leave me alone. You beat me up. You took my money. Fine. I don't care. But now this is the promise, baby. You've told me. And you're doing this to us? And my wife would come to that little boy and she would, she would touch him and she would lay hands on him and she would read the Bible to him every day and she would play 24 hours, 7 days a week music, Christian music, and she would invite those different people coming all the time all day and night the doctor said there's no chance he's not going to survive so i went to work i had to work i had to borrow money at that time just to pay for the parking i would buy, come back from work and i would change and shower and eat and would come to the hospital to replace her so she can go and have a shower and eat and i would stand there in intensive care i would see other children dying every day and being replaced with other children and I would stand in this big machinery. See, my son did not have even one vein that they could put the needle on. He had veins in the head, in every arm, in his feet, tiny little born, just born boy. And, uh, and uh, this machinery, this, this big thing in his mouth, breathing for him and doing everything for him. They said, this boy cannot live. He doesn't have a lung. You understand? Unplug him. He is in extreme pain. And from time to time, he would shake. That's pain. You know, your son is in pain. Unplug him. And my wife said, no. No. And that was going on for a while. And, and one day, and this is the story. You can forget everything. You can forget about me. 
Just do not forget what I'm about to tell you. That's the reason I was born. To tell the people what happened. As I was standing there, watching my son in intensive care, and the doctors coming and the nurses, and there's nothing I can do. If I was a surgeon, I would grab that scalpel and fix my son myself. Couldn't do it. There's no amount of money that could fix my son. No one could. He had the best surgeon in the land. I remember reading it, what she put on the paper. She says, when I opened him up, there was not even a trace. It looked like the lung was never there. They saw him back together. They, there was nothing they can do. And I'm standing over there. My wife took off, and, and that was every day the same thing. And I just stood. I would not touch my son. I was afraid I would break. When I touch him, it would be over for me. I would break. My heart would break. And then the vision opened. When I'm standing over there, and I saw Jesus in Gethsemane, you see, if you would say to a businessman that there are visions and dreams, I would say you're crazy. I had this famous saying, show me the money. Put the money on the table, we'll talk business. I wanted to touch it. I wanted to see it. Show me the land. Show me the building, and then we'll talk business. Visions, you're crazy. Stop drinking whatever you're drinking. And it happened to me, and I saw Jesus in Gethsemane, and I saw him sweating with the blood, and I, I saw how afraid he was. He was terrified. And then I saw a mob of people, like wolves, hyenas coming, filled with demons. They had, they had hate in their hearts. It was over a thousand people dressed differently, and there were Roman soldiers and and people dressed weird. I've never seen people dressed like this before. And they came and and they were looking for Jesus. And he says, I am. When he said, I am, I saw power like I've never seen before, knocking them to the ground. And the next thing I see all of them on their knees. And I said, God, I don't understand. They were knocked from the back. And then I see them on the knees. So what I did, I laid myself on the back, on the ground, trying to stand up. And it turned out that the only way I could do it is to go to my knee. See, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that he is the Lord. Even those that came to arrest him had to take a knee. The violence started right away. They dragged him to this during the night hour, and I'm seeing all of this, and I don't understand what's going on. It's not like a movie. I'm there. They can't see me, but I'm there, and I see everything, every detail. I hear the conversations, and they took him to this court. There was many people there, and fancy dress people, and important people. I knew they were important. I, I knew they are Pharisees and Sadducees, and lawyers, and educated people, and I and I saw them mocking him and spitting in his face and punching. They punched him with a fist. They punched him with like a woman punches. And then from the back saying, you're nothing. You're nothing. And they were laughing at him and mocking. And I saw this young guy coming about 20, 30 feet. And he runs towards Jesus. He grabs his beard and he rips it out. And the blood splashes on my face. A portion of his beard with his skin was ripped off his face. I've seen a lot of blood in my life. I've given a lot of bloody noses and broken noses, but I've never seen anyone being tortured the way he was tortured. And I ran away. I kept running. I don't even know how I got home. I just kept running from the hospital. I, I needed this to stop. See, I did not feel the pain of God, I, I, the Son. I did not feel the, the torture of Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you what I felt. I felt the pain of the Father. We talk about what Jesus did on the cross. We talk about the suffering and beatings. But how many times we talk about the Father watching his Son being spat punched and beaten, tortured. See, I was a father too. I would do everything to save my son. I would kill you to save him. But the father watched it, and he had the power to stop it. You see, he's the king. 
One word in this earth is gone. One word and he would start a new heaven, a new earth, and he chose not to. And I saw him sitting on the throne on the edge of the seat. And he was so heartbroken. And I felt his pain and he said, how dare they? This dust, he calls us dust. How dare this dust touch my son? Unbearable. So next day came and I was hoping I'll never see something like this again. And I'm there standing, my wife took off and the vision starts where it ended. I saw the conversation between Pontius Pilate and Jesus and I can tell you what they were talking about and Jesus did talk. You know, there is this verse, I've heard it from the preachers, I said, no, that's not how it went. A sheep led to the slaughter, he did not open his mouth. They completely did not understand that verse. See, Jesus was a lion for three and a half years, but the last day he turns into a lamb, but that doesn't mean he did not talk. He gave up his life, he willfully went, but he had a conversation with the people. And I saw it. He answered questions, he talked, he was not defending himself. He went like a lamb without opening his mouth in his defense, but he talked. And then I saw the beatings of the soldiers. I'm unbearable. Not because Jesus was tortured. You see, in history, there were many people tortured. People burned on stakes. And I remember studying law. We had this chapter of studying about torture. And I learned about people that they were taught how to torture people, torture people properly, how to skin them alive, chop their fingers. And during the Middle Ages, they would do it in such a way that the client had to survive three days in the most horrible condition. So I knew all of that stuff. But imagine being a father or a mother and seeing your child being tortured and you can have, you have the power, you can stop it at any moment and you're choosing not to. And not for your friends, not for your family members, you're choosing not to for your enemies. When we were his enemies, he died for us. the beatings that he got. You see, Jesus, when he was sweating with the blood, he was not afraid of the physical beating. I mean, yes, it was painful, but he was afraid that he's going to be left alone. You see, Jesus is holy. And that was the first time that he would take his sin of yours and mine upon his shoulders. And there will be a separation between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the first time. That's why he was afraid. He was a man willing to take the beating, but he was terrified of taking the filth upon his holy being. So I ran away for the second time, and I kept running, and I stopped, and I said, this is ridiculous. I can't escape. I have to come back. So I calmed down, and I went back. And I stood in the same place watching my son and the vision started again for the third time. I saw him being nailed to a tree. I saw him crucified naked. You know, Jesus was crucified naked. Not like the movies. It was nothing like the movie. Mel Gibson's movie is nothing. What I saw. When I look at him on that tree, I could not tell if he is a man or a woman. It was just a bloody thing. There was not an inch on his body. There was flesh, regular flesh, a color of his skin. It was all blood. The darkness, the darkness that came, it's not the darkness that we can understand. The whole earth was dark. It was darkness. It was real darkness. I could not see a thing. And, and the earthquake, I saw earthquake, not a local one. I saw the whole earth split. The whole earth split in half. It was a global earthquake. And when he gave up his, his spirit, I saw a bird, a little bit. I could not recognize that, but I never see it in my life. And I saw a close-up of his eyes, and he was crying. And a tear was coming from the eye of that bird. And then I saw a speck of grass. And don't ask me how, but the grass was crying. 
The creation was crying because the creator just gave up his life for the creation. And it was over. It ended and and then he spoke to me. And this is what he says, what would you do to save your son? And I said, anything, tell me to kill and I will kill. I will wipe out half of this hospital if needs be. That's what I said. But he didn't, he didn't change his tone of voice. He says, but you cannot do anything to save your son. But I could save my son and I didn't do it. You know why? And he paused. He says, for you and for the rest of the people. I saw two hearts. I realized how evil and wicked of a man I was. I saw my own heart. It was like a filth. It was like, like the darkest, most filthiest thing on earth. It was my heart, a heart of a father. And then I saw his heart. If you would see his heart, the most beautiful thing, like a crystal, loving, perfect. His heart was moving inside, everything was moving, it was life itself. I think I got broken that day. My wife came and she said, would you drive me to the church? So we went to the church, pastor was doing some kind of a vigil, praying for us and for the baby. I remember going in and I lifted my hands and I said, God, I'm giving you my son. like Abraham on the altar. Do with him as you please. If you save him, I will be the most grateful man on earth. If you choose to take him home, I just ask for one thing, let it be now. If he's to die, let him die now. I can't do this anymore. I can't be in this pain. I can't see my wife in this pain. If he's to die, let it be now. And nothing happened. I started to cry like I never cried before and tears were coming. And you know what I saw? I saw my tears. It was a weird thing. Every tear was representing something evil that I've done. Smuggling, guns, beatings, fights, drinking. Every evil thing I've done in my life was coming with those tears. And I started to cry so hard. I could not stop. I don't even remember what they were talking about. I don't remember what they said. I, I don't even remember where they were. I, I, I just saw that there were some people, but this was between me and God. And my hands lifted high and my son on the altar and I kept crying and crying and I ran out of tears. And I said to him again, I'm giving you my son on the altar like Abraham Isaac. Do, you, do with him as you please. And I'm giving you my word that from now on, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. No matter what. Nothing happened. No earthquakes. He didn't speak to me. And then the next day I went to work. No one called me. No one said anything. Just like those few weeks before, I went to the hospital and as I was walking, those people started to point a finger at me and they would say, that's the father of the star baby. Look, look, that's the father and the nurses and the people. That's the father of the star baby. And I had no clue what they're talking about. No one called me. My wife didn't call me. As I reached the intensive care, I was prepared to see the empty bed. I made my peace with God. But he was still there, but the machinery was not in him. That was weird. And the three doctors, the same three doctors that came to me and said, you should unplug him, he will never live. He will be a vegetable. 
at best for the rest of his life. The same three doctors came and says, you got to come with us. You have to come. Something happened this morning. They took me to this x-ray room and there was seven, eight pictures. And they said, you see the first one? And if you want to watch the story, if you want to see what I'm talking to you, watch a documentary they did about this story. It's called Street Advocate. It's on YouTube, Street Advocate. And you can see the x-rays yourself. You see the bowels? You see the whole thing? That's what it caused the damage and it smashed everything. And, and the heart was pushed and, and the lung was not there and there was nothing we could do. Look at the second one this morning that we took. Your son started to fight with machinery. And we thought it's a malfunctioning of the equipment. So we took it out just for a split of a second. And it turned out your son is breathing. And they look at me. Okay. No, you don't get it, right? You don't understand what happened. Your son cannot breathe. He doesn't have a lung. So we started to take a picture. Every hour, you see the second one? You see that little tiny thing? That's your son's lung. And then you see the third, fourth, fifth. It's growing as we speak. <laughs> Within two hours, the heart moved to its natural place. And your son is breathing on his own. So we call a symposium of doctors and we call your son a star baby. This is a baby that should not be alive, but is living. It's a baby that should not breathe, but is breathing. It's like a star baby, a baby that came from the stars. For over 10 years, my son was being examined by the best of the best. And to this day, they do not understand what happened. They said, it looks like you, God, heard your prayers. And they have a chart. Remember what God said? This is what God said. I'm going to give you a perfect gift, right? But he didn't say to me that I have to wait a little bit longer for that perfect gift. But he said, I'm going to give you a perfect gift. He's born the same day I was born. And he names him a gift from God. And you know what the doctor said, even 10 years later? They said, you have a perfect son. In the scales, the baby is born, they have those charts. And he, they said, we can't figure this out. He is always in the middle, perfection in everything. So that's my son, Nathaniel. After we had another real, he's 16. And then we had a daughter, Maya, she's 12. And here I am. How can I shut down the church? How can I say, how can I say that my God is not bigger than my enemies? How can I say that Fauci has power over God's kingdom? How can I say that if God can raise from the dead, he is not going to take me off the hook. See, the enemy is building a gallow for me, I know. I've seen it before. I don't know what they're going to do to me when I get back, but I'm going back. And I'm going to face my giants. And my life, just like my life of my son, will be in his hands. And may his will be done. I give all the glory to him for everything. I need your prayers. Pray. But don't pray that my enemies will be removed. Pray that God would give me boldness to face whatever I'm facing. Pray that out of this, many will come to the kingdom of God. Pray for a will of my Father in my life. His will in my life. Not the enemies. So be blessed. We are running number of churches we feed thousands of people we started another church in the building i traveled all over the world i've started ministries called march for jesus i love his name i started ministries in africa i ministered in different places and i know that this is just the beginning not the end see when my son was born there was just the beginning not the end i thought it was the end Sometimes we are overwhelmed by whatever enemy is throwing at us, whatever, whatever God is allowing the enemy to bring. That's your promotion. In the fire, Jesus shows up. In the fire, he deals with your enemies. In the fire, he promotes his people. In the fire, he has the encounter.
with this church. So go to the fire, face whatever you need to face, and give glory to the living God. Be blessed. Now, now you remain standing if you would. Now you know why when the Lord knit our hearts and put us in these three peculiar cities at the same time, that I knew he was supposed to come and that these two days were the only days he had open at the time. So he is here by design right now, and so are you. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Because we've seen the miracles, right, Carol? We've seen the creative miracles. You've heard the word on boldness. We're seeing boldness incarnate, okay, because of the miracles and the power of God, the creative miracle, all right? So this anointing is here for you, okay? It's for you. So before we go further, I'm going to ask Pastor Art to pray for us. But I want you to all open your palm, your palms in front of you. O open yourself. Open your, lift your arms just like this to receive. All right, Pastor, pray for us. Just impart to us whatever the Lord um, has you to impart for us and, and and our city and every city represented here. You know, after I've seen what I've seen. I went back to business because that's the only thing I, I knew how to do. And I had my fancy office in Bankers Hall in the city of Calgary. I own a number of companies. God blessed me left and right after this. And in 2005, I hear the same voice. And he says, pack your stuff from your office and walk out in your underwear. And I knew I am to leave everything behind and never look back at Egypt. And that day, 2005, five years after what I saw with my son, Nathaniel, I walked out of business and I never went back to my own company. I lost millions of dollars, houses, properties, and I started a ministry that's called Street Church today. Street Church. And I started over 40 of them in different cities, different countries. And he wants to do the same thing with all of us. Sometimes we just don't understand what he wants. So we go back to the known thing like Peter went back to fishing until he had another encounter with Jesus. I wish that every man, every woman would have that encounter with Jesus. Because when you see him, your life will never be the same. And that's what I pray for you. Amen. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I pray that everyone will have that revelation of who you are what kind of a God you are yes. and who they are in God, that they are sons and daughters of the mighty King, that they are the lionesses and lions following the lion from the tribe of Judah. I pray for boldness and supernatural in their lives. I pray for courage. I pray for strength and I pray for a spirit of faith that moves the mountains in their lives and the lives of people that they encounter. I pray that out of this place, many mighty men and women oh. of God will come. Yes. That they will be trained for such a time as this. Yes. This is no accident that we are here. I just want to release that. Yes. Out of lawbreakers, troublemakers, rock yeah. 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 that came and joined David in the cave of Adullam, you're going to turn them around and you're going to make your men of valor, the mighty men and women of David. I release that upon this yes. land. Yes. Texas shall be known in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth as a land of the warriors. Yes. The mighty men and women of valor yes. for God in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. 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 Let's clap to the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated for just a moment longer. Uh, Pastor Art faces certain arrest when he returns. Okay. He, he, he will be arrested. He, he was found guilty uh, in a court 
he attended the court by Zoom here in the States. So he stayed. He was supposed to be here for two or three weeks. It's been three months since he's been home. And by the way, I asked him, how are the churches treating you? Well, he loves America. He's absolutely fallen in love with this country. Um, but, you know, uh, an interesting thing, I'm going to, I'm, you know, this is online. I'll probably get in trouble for saying this. But he said, the smaller churches bless me the most. He's facing hundreds of thousands of dollars of fines and certain imprisonment when he returns. Uh, today, we have a privilege of receiving a love offering for him. We're going to give. We're going to sow. He came for the conference, and that was one thing. But, you know, I, I did as the Lord told me. I, I, I asked him to change his flight and stay another day. And he's just another brother from another mother. You know how the saying goes. He said, yes. He said, I'm here to work. He said, I'm here to work. I pray the working anointing comes off of him and comes into us. <laughs> More people ready to work for the kingdom. And I'm so grateful for everybody that works so hard. I mean, so many just didn't wait around to be asked. They just started working and, and got things done. I'm, I'm so grateful for the hardworking people that put the, the meeting on this weekend. I'm grateful for everybody that, uh, that, that attended, had enough vision and faith to attend to see what the Lord was saying. I'm thankful that you came today to hear what the Lord was saying, what he is saying to us. And what you deposited here, Art, is going to have repercussions. Now, I see it like a, a, a rock hitting the water, and it just keeps going out. Everywhere you go, that is happening. So you have been sowing into this country, all weaving all over in these three months, doing that. And it, it's, it's got repercussions all over our nation and the world. And aren't we blessed that his only stop in Texas is here? I mean, how do you explain that? This place, Waco, Texas. We are so blessed. So I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. We're going to pass the baskets uh, and um, just make the check out to the church. Don't worry about just Christ the King. Uh, we're going to take care of Art. Um, we're going to bless him from this offering. Uh, and I'm so grateful for, you know, I, I always say the greatest offering is received is always ask the Lord what he wants you to give and, and do that. Or as I like to say, just throw your credit card in the basket. It's okay. <laughs> Kidding. Lighten, light it up a little bit. Lighten it up a little bit. So, Lord, bless this offering, we pray. We give it for your namesake, for your kingdom advancement, Lord. And those online, you can give online. It's, it's, it's on there somewhere. Figure it out. You can do it. So Lord, bless this offering for your kingdom's sake, because we are desperate for an awakening to hit this land, Lord. Use this man of God. Help us to sow into keeping him going, keeping his tank full. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead, pass the baskets here. Play some worship music, if you would, while we wait just a moment longer. And Carol is going to link on the websites, the various websites and the YouTube channel. Uh, she's going to put uh, today a link to Street Advocate so you can see the documentary. Okay? Good idea? Good idea. So I want you all to see it. And we're going to, we, let's, let's just de declare right now that we covenant with you, Pastor, to pray for you. Okay? And we're going to watch you. We're going to cover you in prayer. We plead the blood of Jesus over you. That, you know, you will accomplish everything the Lord has uh, sent, sent you to accomplish. Just while we're receiving and worshiping the Lord in our giving, you send your hand toward Pastor Art. And Lord, we just, we, we thank you that he is covered, that there's a fresh and new angelic guard around him, that you are making the path straight for him, Lord. You're ordering his steps. And we thank you, Lord, that this incredible revelation of the Father heart of God you've given him would only continue to be uh, imparted and expanded upon, and, and it would increase, Lord, that we might know your heart as our dad, as our as a loving father. Lord, just continue to use uh, art that way and 
increase his revelation. Lord, we say more, more, Lord, for he give him more revelation, more understanding, more insight. We declare increase into your life every day till you take your last breath. Continued increase of the presence of God, ever expanding, ever increasing Holy Spirit presence in your life. Your, your, your uh, wife's life, your three children, precious children. We bless, we bless, and we honor you in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Remember the vision of uh, traffic jams on Sunday mornings. Coming. Awakening is coming. That's why the devils are all stirred up right now. It's like I told you, the first before the first great awakening, after the first great awakening came the revolutionary war after the second great awakening came more war civil war after the welsh revival by the way if you didn't get a book this weekend i i we, we sewed the the a book a little easy to read book on the welsh revival uh to everybody that attended the conference uh, we ordered 500 of them to give away uh because i believe those, it's a look, seed of revival and awakening anointing is on those pages uh, that that uh, a revival preceded World War One. OK, so every time there and there's a coming move of God, it's happening now in these United States. We bless every country listening right now. But in these United States, it is stirring. And that's why the devils are all enraged. OK, uh, more lions are raising up in Canada. Uh, he was shocked in, in Calgary. And he, he's like, uh, I won't say what he said about Canada. Only he can say that. Stuff that he was shocked. Eight thousand said no more, no more, and they rallied in the streets protesting against the government. Eight thousand, and it's you were shocked, right? Art, you were just shocked. I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe that people uh, are taking a stand. And it's interesting. Uh, and, and is is your um, court response is that posted on your website anywhere? On Rebel News, it's there. His statement, uh, uh, he read in full at the conference, uh, and it's it's interesting that uh, in this 500th anniversary of Martin Luther, he, he closed by declaring, here I stand, I can do no more. As he declared the illegality of what the government was doing, he stood up to them. Uh, and I, I, I just, I, I, um, you know, I preach on boldness. I ask God for more boldness and and. You know, I, 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 again, I say it again. This is boldness incarnated, okay? The, the anointing that's here. Now, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you have time to visit with people. Everybody's going to mob you, but, he, he, you know, I just ask you, if you come to talk to him, don't come telling stories, okay? Say hello, give a greeting, get out of the way so somebody else can say hello. Will you honor him that way? Because he's going to stick around, and then we're going to dash to the airport. All right? So don't come telling stories. We don't have time to hear stories. He doesn't have time. we got to get to the airport. But if you want to come get a greeting, you know I'm saying this lovingly, right? Don't get mad. Don't get hurt. Okay? Don't get your feelers hurt. Okay? Come. Get blessed. Say hello to him. Meet him. Uh, but lovingly, as dad, don't come take a lot of time. Okay? Fair enough. Deal? Deal? Okay. Let's stand up. Yeah, if you have a word for him, uh, send it to the office. Put it in email, please. Don't don't come prophesying. We don't have time. We want the word. Okay. But email the word. Uh, it's a great gift God's given us. Email. Amen. All right. Hold somebody's hand. Father, we humble ourselves before you. And we thank you, Lord, for a family of faith that can come together. Lord, we declare we will not neglect to come together as you've told us to, Lord. Uh, we, we pray and we celebrate all the gifts from everyone that, that comes in, all the, the spiritual gifts at work in the family of faith here, Lord. We pray that we could continue to make more disciples uh, that are full of the anointing of your spirit, that great exploits might be done, that more babies would be healed, saved, delivered. Lord, that the, the, the extraordinary and unusual miracles would only increase, Lord, that our hospitals would be emptied, that the curse of COVID would be destroyed. Lord, we, we declare just as you have supernaturally healed people of AIDS, Lord, you can supernaturally heal people of anything. 
You can create lungs where there are no lungs. So, Lord, we celebrate you. We fix our eyes on you. We fix our eyes on you. And we ask, God, now your blessing and abundance to go forward to everybody listening. In the strong name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight, today. God bless you. We're done.